Okay. Um, but before we get started, let me just put in a quick plug for the Friends of Imperial Membership Drive that's happening this year. Um, we do want to make sure that everybody knows about it. Um, it's an individual um, campaign, so you can join as an individual um, pledge uh, to, to be a friend of Aperio, and it helps to support our mission. It helps to um, allow us to do things like um, this microconference that you're attending right now. Uh, and it will also um, provide you with opportunities to develop professionally. So there's a number of memberships, um, things like Educause and, and other associations that Aperio is involved with, that if you're a friend of Aperio, you can access those resources. Um, and it also helps to keep our community active and growing. So I really hope that you'll think about it and tell your friends. Um, membership is only $100 um, for uh, professional folks and $25 for students. So it's really kind of a deal for students. Um, so uh, we'd like to encourage people to join. And our goal is to get 1,000 new memberships um, this year. So we're in the latter half of the year. So <laughs> uh, hopefully you'll help us uh, get over that milestone. Um, so I've got the, um, the web address there at the bottom. I'll paste it into the chat here in a moment if you want to um, go to the Aperio website to um, become a friend of Aperio. So uh, with that said, um, today's session is about open ed tech in an AI future. And um, you know, AI has sort of taken the world by storm. It's been the topic of many a, a conference and many a presentation lately. We hear a lot of noise about it, um, but uh, you know, there's also a, a lot to think about as we transition into a future that has generative AI in it. And today we have the founder of Moodle, um, who's been thinking about this kind of stuff since 1999. So he was, he was thinking about it a long time ago, and he's gonna be offering some of his current thoughts about a future powered by generative AI and how that might change uh, the landscape in ed tech. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Martin Dugiamas. Um, since 2001, Martin has been best known as the Australian guy who founded and led Moodle, the open source learning platform that's used by institutions all over the world. A lot of his original code is still in Moodle today. Martin was full-time CEO of Moodle for over 20 years until January 2024. He recently decided to move to a new role running the Moodle Research Lab as head of research where he gets to get his hands dirty with cutting edge technologies, again, especially AI and AR, which is critical for understanding where education and open education technology will go in coming decades. Martin's also the founder of Open Ed Tech, a nonprofit based in Brussels, which is a new association of organizations and professionals interested in promoting open technology and education. He serves as the director of Open Education Global, a nonprofit that promotes open education globally. So I'm going to turn it over now to Martin and let him uh, tell us all about uh, his thoughts on AI. Thank you, Wilma. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, for those in the US, uh, uh, a bit of remembrance for September 11. Uh, all of us around the world remember that day. Um, like, it wasn't that long ago, really, but uh, it, uh, it was an amazing event that brought us all together. And anyway, I'm glad we're all here together to talk about other world shaking events like uh, AI and things in education. Um, a little clarification on that bio. I'm not the director of o Open Education Global. I'm a board director with about 12 people. Um, but I've got a lot I want to get through and some, uh, quite a bit of it is stuff I've not really talked about before. And uh, I'm not sure how long I'm going to need, so I'm just going to crack on. And by the end, uh, we'll hopefully have time for some audio q a but i really love it if you type your thoughts as we go in the chat if you have questions or thoughts uh, keep the back channel going and it, i'll keep an eye on it if i see anything i, I might refer to it and jump in but um, otherwise questions at the end thanks hopefully that's good um, so open ed tech in an ai future all my favorite words in one sentence uh, so this is me. Uh, there was some introduction. Uh, you may have noticed there were three organizations. These are the three organizations I'm part of right now. Um, head of research at Moodle, 
uh, director, board director at Open Education Global and Open EdTech. And I've got the OET web uh, shirt on and I've also got an OET mug here. So that mostly it's Open EdTech today. Uh, and there's some contact details if you want to contact me. I'll show this again at the end. Oh, one thing I wanted to say about that was uh, you see down the bottom corner here a very small uh, little yellow star, little sparkle. So I really believe in uh, calling out AI when you see it. So this is an AI generated picture in the background. Um, so you'll see that as like a, my own watermark on AI images through in the, throughout the presentation. So Moodle, I, I'm assuming most of you know what Moodle is. I have really one slide on it. Uh, Moodle was always about empowering educators to improve the world uh, with the most effective platform for learning. And that was the, the mission, remains the mission. Uh, it's uh, Moodle HQ is now around 300 people in 23 countries. It's a very global thing. Um, we are very strongly values based. Um, we are very widely used, uh, as uh, was mentioned um, in this couple of years ago. Some stats from List EdTech uh, said about two thirds of the world's higher ed is using Moodle um, globally. And uh, it's very important to me that it always has been that Moodle is a, a purpose organization. So we have we are a certified B corporation, which means that uh, Moodle is very oriented around its purpose and around supporting the community. And of course, it's open source. Now you, you probably knew all of that. I think it's about 420 million users at the moment. It's a very, it became from me starting it as one person, it became a large organization with a bureaucracy that I had built myself over 20 odd years. And that's why I stepped back as CEO because it's just, that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was learn and research and work on the future. And that's what I've been able to do this year. And so I have a lot of stuff I want to talk about in that vein. And I run the Moodle Research Lab at Moodle. Um, it's not in the hierarchy of the 300 people. It's off to the side. Uh, I report to the board and uh, I get to do pretty much whatever I want. Um, and what I want is to uh, think about the future and try and plan the next 10 years uh, for Moodle, but really for lots of other things as well that are associated. I apologize if English is not your first language and this is a bit fast, but I have a lot I want to get through. This will be recorded, so hopefully you'll be able to go back and um, or ask an AI to summarize it for you later. Um, but the Moodle Research Lab is, uh, there it is at moodle.me slash research. It's the, you can go and it's open to all. You can, you're very welcome to come along. Um, Open Education Global is a fantastic organization that uh, is, is more broadly about open education in total. Uh, a lot of that tends to be around content, but um, it's, it's broad and, and has a conference every year and a, a lot of activities and I see Alan Levine, AKA Cog Dog, is in the, the chat today. So, uh, hi, Alan. And uh, Open EdTech, as said, I started uh, in, the, in the last couple of years, uh, formally opened uh, last year, having a slow takeoff because uh, of the resources that I can put into it as, as and when I do. But I'm going to very quickly run through what Open EdTech is trying to do uh, before we get into the other stuff because. There's a lot of context. So this is the four things that Open EdTech does. Uh, firstly, it tries to define and promote Open EdTech as an ecosystem and a trustworthy brand. There wasn't anything out there that was quite doing the same. I know Aperio is very, very close, um, but I had some slightly different goals for Open EdTech, as you'll see. Um, <clears throat> the second goal here is about certifying. And it's certifications are very useful to understand that, yes, a particular thing has gone through a check and, and that the brand can be applied to it. Some sort of trust can be uh, applied to that thing. So we certify technologies meeting these five requirements. I'll whiz through these really quick. Number one has to be open source, right? That's uh, the most transparent, trusted model of development that I know. Um, and it has to be an open source license. 
Uh, uh, recently, I've been working with uh, OSI on the new definition of open source for open source AI, which has been really interesting, uh, trying to apply that to AI tools and a lot of uh, discussions going on there. But they will have a definition soon. And if there's AI talked about here, it'll also have to conform to the open source definition. Uh, the second criteria of being an open edtech certified technology is that you have to be sustainably developed. And this is number two because I feel it's so important. You need to have a long term vision. There needs to be people who are backing that vision and building a sustainable model. Uh, as you know, there are way too many pieces of software that are open source, but they are sitting on GitHub and nobody looks at it again and they just withers on the vine and that's not something that uh, education can trust and depend on sustainability is super important the third criteria is you have to listen to educators and you'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen in ed tech uh, educators must be able to interact with the developers there has to be processes to provide feedback and the developers need to be responsive and so when you're certifying, you have to actually show that you have all these things set up. And number three is about supporting a community of, de of developers. So that's not just putting it on, on a uh, repository, but building community engagement and processes for contributing to that software, making it inclusive through documentation and support, and uh, really building up that open source ecosystem, which is so important. Uh, for all open source software, but in education in particular, uh, it's it's from my experience. You know, we have thousands of contributors to Moodle that have, uh, over the years, uh, that have been scratching their itch in their own particular uh, installation and contributed back. And lastly, it should use standards. Now, what standards is something that we are working on. Um, there are. Uh, Standards enable interoperability and um, uh, Chuck Severance is in the room, I see. Uh, one of the most uh, famous inventor of a standard in ed tech that I know, uh, going so far as to put tattoos on his arm. Hi, Chuck. So um, uh, that's a great standard, not just because of the tattoos, but uh, because it's really going for a very useful case and it's definitely a one I support. Um, however, there are many standards. Uh, you might have seen the XKCD cartoon, which is there. Are, someone says, oh, there are 14 standards. We need to build a new one that just encapsulates all that. And then you end up with 15 standards. And that happens a lot. There are some standards that, which are really uh, good and some standards which nobody is using because they're not good or they're not useful or they don't attack the right needs and so on. Um, so what Open EdTech is trying to do is to curate the minimum set of standards, and some might be from LTI and some might be from other standards bodies that we think as an association are the minimum set that everybody should support. And part of being certified is saying that you commit to supporting that core set of standards. Um, so we're not creating standards, we're just curating standards. Oh, here's another slide about it. Um, there's three main areas we're looking at. One is data uh, and representing data and sharing data. Uh, interoperability, such as LTI or Matrix, uh, for allowing software to connect. And tech stacks, so even components that we can standardize on in the ed tech field to say, we, we really are all going to use this component. Um, and the reason why you might want to choose particular components is that if everyone's used to the same tool set, uh, there's a lot better conversations you can have about moving on from those. Um, and look, lastly, we provide networking opportunities and Aperio is, does that, so that's why we're here. Um, but the more the merrier, I think. So openedtech.global if you wanna look into more, more about that. Uh, now, to get onto the main meat here, to talk about education and technology, you need to look at the whole world. You need to understand the whole world to a degree. Uh, you, it's so connected as an innately human activity that is necessary. 
in our world today, we have a lot of problems. Uh, here are some of them. Um, a couple, you know, we got capitalism going a bit over the top. We've got mental health crises, we, crises. we've got uh, aging populations, food and water security, social fragmentation, global pandemics, um, human, human rights violations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? These things are occurring. Sure, the world is maybe, if you look at it in total, not as bad off as it was 100 years ago, but there are still a lot of big problems in the world, and some of them are new as well, like recent. The UN Sustainable Development Goals have been around for quite some time now, but they remain the best agenda that the whole world agreed on as things to fix to make the world sustainable. Um, and of course, number four, still there, which is all about inclusive and equitable quality education um, and promoting lifelong learning for all. It's one of our goals. And this is not just because I like the SDGs. This is literally something that every country in the world, apart from maybe one or two, um, agreed upon as the agenda. Now, right now, uh, globally, I don't think education is that good at all. Uh, and it's been getting worse. Um, in the last century, we've morphed most education into creating specialised workers, almost like honeybees. Um, we're not aiming at creating global citizens, right? The whole dialogue around education is about jobs and those we all go and get jobs and, and we align ourselves with organisations and companies. <clears throat> So much of the direction of evolution of things is directed by profit-focused companies. Um, have you seen that movie? Uh, oh gosh, I should really remember the name. It just uh, was just occurred to me, but um, it's about uh, pharmaceutical companies and their selling tactics. It's a fiction. It's a, not a fiction. It's based on truth, but it's a drama. Um, but you know how that's caused the uh, epidemic of opioids in the U.S. Um, that kind of behavior from profit focused companies is causing a lot of problems. So in this case, uh, problems with healthcare. And it's a weird situation we've got ourselves into. Um, and education increasingly becomes focused on delivering better and more trained, better workers for companies predominantly. So hold that thought and let's look at the automated world that is coming and, and how it could look, how it could be different uh, and what that might look like. Back in the early 90s, I was raving on about the internet. Nobody was using the internet yet. I was actually running uh, seminars for my city. I had people from all over the city coming uh, every week for, to, for me to tell them about the new internet because I was working at a university. And I was using it every day, but most people hadn't touched it yet. And I was saying then the internet is going to completely change every single industry that we have. And now we're very used to it. We do our banking through our, our phone. We do uh, everything. We do everything online if you want to. Um, it has affected almost every single industry. I would say every industry, actually. Um, last three years, I'm Generative AI is going to do even more, and you're already we're already seeing a big difference in its impact from, from three years ago, but uh, we only we haven't seen anything yet, as you'll see. Um, language models are much are very smart and already, and these are the most basic ones that you can that we're ever going to see. Uh, they're in, they're increasing in uh, intelligence uh, quickly. Um, they surpass any of us at most thinking, writing type tasks. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't need to tell you, I'm, sh I'm assuming you're all using AI as at least, you know, chat GPT or Claude or, or uh, Llama or something as a, 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 on, a on a regular basis. Uh, we're, we're, we're generating videos. Uh, those videos are getting um, better and better. This was from a Sora demonstration earlier this year, but since then there's at least five or six things that are approaching that quality all coming out in recent months. Um, 
we have music generation going on. Um, I, I love making music and I've been playing a lot. I mean, I have done that for decades, but I love playing with these music generation tools and sound generation tools. Um, incredible leaps in performance from month to month. Uh, recently, there's been some stuff on world generation. So uh, this project, and I should have put the name here, but uh, you can look it up and look up uh, 1000 person Minecraft world. So they got 1000 AIs living in a world and they basically worked out how to do democracy by themselves. They, they worked out all kinds of um, behaviors that were uh, coming out of that. So as a research tool, quite amazing as, as agents in general are quite, um, have huge potential. You may have seen the demos from OpenAI of their multimodal interactions. And this is a AI models that are not just trained on text, but also trained on audio and video. Um, and the models trained on all those forms of data are very good at those forms of data. Thanks Grant for that reference for earlier. Um, the, the natively being able to speak gives it a super extra power that suddenly you feel like you can relate with the AI. Uh, and I'll, I should post a link of another one that came out last week. Um, but it it really makes the difference. It's very, it changes it from being a you say this and now I say that kind of conversation to being a very human interaction. But it's not just the generating capability of LLMs, the LLM services that, that is the exciting thing. Um, there is a lot of work going on throughout the field in increasing the short term memory or the context, improving reasoning, uh, integration with everything, uh, adding, so AI is being able to reach out and use tools and uh, connect and join to things or, or run your computer or your phone, uh, adding long-term memory, so making them remember like we do, um, embodying them in the real world so that there's not a lack of data off the internet anymore. We have the world's data, uh, just like we collect data by walking around and seeing things and touching things. Um, the performance, the hardware is increasing rapidly. The, um, the GPUs that everyone's using were designed for graphics it's actually a total hack that they work at all. Um, but there are new forms of hardware that are 10,000 times more efficient and more, which is like 10,000th of the energy of a GPU for the same performance uh, or, or alternately like a thousand times faster as well. There are people working on the copyright issues. There are people working on long-term agents. There are people working on local AI. And you'll notice even Apple and Google, uh, Samsung are now uh, working on getting AI to run on your personal devices. Um, and I've been using an AI on my laptop for a couple of years, but uh, it's going to really hit the mainstream soon as we have AI running on everything. So it's clear that uh, where we are now is right at the beginning of this curve. Like everything you're seeing out there is the dumbest and the stupidest and the slowest it's ever going to be. And it will increase a lot in capability over the next year, the rest of your life, right? It's not going away. You may be familiar with the Gartner hype cycle graph. I would say we're about here right now. And mostly this talks about the evidences that you see on the news. So what a company's doing and buying and investing in things or what's the what are the headlines around this particular technology and there is a bunch of negative stuff there's a bunch of pushback there's a bunch of tiredness there's a bunch of uh, uh, failed expectations of venture capitalists and so on but in the background the science and the research and the development is improving quietly and going forward as uh, at, at pace so I feel very confident that this kind of is representing how AI looks to the public and it you'll will just one day turn around like we did with the internet. You remember the, the dot com boom in the late nineties, right? Billions of dollars pushed into companies and then, oh no, it's all failed and it flopped over. And where are we now? We're at the end of that curve and the internet is so embedded in our lives. We don't even think about it. It's definitely what AI is going to do too.
Let me mention a couple of other little things along the way, augmented reality. So I, I nearly turned up today in, as my persona in this Vision Pro because um, I've been using VR since 1996. I had a VFX1 headset. Um, it wasn't very good and it made you sick, but it worked. And I've been waiting for a device of this level of capability because if you've used it, uh, you'll know, but it finally nails the uh, mix of digital and uh, in the real world to a level where I actually use this every day. I work in this thing about five hours every day. Um, and the ability to just have my digital world mixed with the real world gets more and more useful. The more you play with it and the more I'm understanding it, I can see that it's it's going to be around and more of us will be doing it, particularly when uh, they get down to this size. And I've got a prototype here of um, this is the Ray Neo. So this is using uh, waveguide technology. So this is a, a screen on the transparent glass. And look, it's, it's really quite good. It's nowhere near the Vision Pro. But the fact that you can get a screen on a piece of glass means that these glasses I'm wearing now, it doesn't seem to be a long way until uh, they have capabilities close to a Vision Pro. Um, it's inevitable, I think, um, the way miniaturization is going. And of course, I really want to talk about humanoid robots. I, I have been following these for decades as well, and uh, it's surprising to everyone, even those in the field, how quickly the last year has been in robots. Um, if you've seen the figure, there, there are many now, there's 20, 30 major companies developing robots. Um, this one is Unitree and it's being designed in China as a mass production thing from the beginning. So this thing can jump in the air, it moves in a very smooth way. So the robots that when they hit our homes are, are not going to be um, heavy, stiff things that move like a robot. They're going to move fluidly like a like we do. They're going to talk as eloquently as ChatGPT talks. They're going to hear us really well. You'll be able to say, oh, hey, Bob, I'm going to go out for half an hour. Can you uh, finish the laundry and, uh, and and get dinner started so it's ready when I get back? And it'll just do it. And that thing will probably cost you about 20000 to start with. Um, so probably the price of another car. And this one here is 35 kilograms. You can pick it up and it folds, it folds itself up. You can pick it up and move it around. Now, when, when they're that cheap and that capable, uh, it's going to affect a lot of things. Um, Remember, remember Bicentennial Man, if you've seen that movie, um, fabulous movie with Robin Williams. Um, that is around the corner. That is, you know, you'll be able to be that, that person taking delivery of a robot probably in about four years, I reckon, maybe five. Um, mostly regulations are going to hold it up, I think, because I worry about somebody sending a robot to come and break into my house or 10 of them. Um, you know, there's all these social issues we need to think about. But the technology is here. And Mustafa Suleiman, one a pretty uh, influential figure in AI, uh, has this quote that I like, uh, which is, these tools are only temporarily augmenting human intelligence. They're fundamentally labor replacing. And this is a very key issue. Because remember back what I was saying before, that most of education is training us to do jobs, to perform labor. And these things are replacing that. AI will replace most human labor at some point, like it's inevitable, because as soon as it's better or cheaper or faster or safer, then any company or any, any sane person probably is going to say, I will get the robot to do it um, because I'm not putting people at risk. Uh, it's, it's a lot cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. All the drivers are there to make this happen. What does the best case of this scenario look like? I call this post-scar city. Um, it's a bit of a joke on post-scarcity. 
So we, we live in a world of scarce, relative scarcity at the moment. Um, uh, I'm sure to be on this call, you probably have a, a fairly high level of, uh, of wealth compared to most people in the world. Um, but um, we still have to pay a lot for things. We have to work hard to get those things. And so there is less things than, than everybody can have, all of them, you know what I mean? There is still scarcity. In a, in a scenario where robots are doing everything very, very cheaply and very efficiently, um, there's more capability to uh, mine the earth, produce materials, make factories to make things, um, uh, look after all the services, keep things running, um, and basically create this idyllic sci-fi utopia, which isn't really sci-fi, it's actually a possibility in the near future. What, do we, what would we do in that world? If, if Imagine we work it out, right? And I'll get into that in a minute. Well, there's actually plenty to do. Um, if this is Maslow's uh, uh, hierarchy of needs, um, and this model has at the bottom, you need your physiological needs, you know, food, water, warmth, rest. Imagine that's taken care of by lots and lots of automation. Um, our safety needs are taken care of as well, hopefully with some very benign uh, cyber cyber robots, uh, cyber cop, uh, robocop, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, but then above that is the more human things, right, that we have to do. We can have intimate relationships and friends. We can work, have uh, accomplish things and, and seek prestige. We can self-actualize ourselves, realize our full potential. Imagine if you didn't have to work, you could learn more about everything and you become a rounded human being um, and, you know, seek enlightenment, basically. So less and less daily grind working for organizations just to earn a living so you can do the other things. I'm sure a lot of you have great jobs and you love your job and that's fine, but it's always going to be a very narrow activity compared to all the things, right? And we'll have more free time now to do that, potentially. Remember, this is the best case scenario. We have free time, pursue our hobbies, support projects, join local community groups, uh, save the earth uh, and care for each other, right? A loving world. I, I joined Toastmasters this year and it's been a lot of fun, actually. A whole lot of random people from my local community and we get together and we talk to each other and we're all learning from each other and good stuff. Like that's great stuff that the sort of things that, that we could all be doing. Really, this is what rich people already do, right? It turns out for a lot of this stuff, just look at what rich people are doing because they have already done away with the need to work. And what are they spending their time doing, right? These things. So we know it works. It's just, how do we make everybody rich is the question. Well, we're going to have to work out some form of universal basic income, right? We'll need that. So um, if you have not familiar with that concept, look it up. But basically the idea is that you, you, you get paid regardless. Um, and like, don't get hung up on the paid part. It's more like you don't have to get things out of your own pocket. You've, it's sorted. There's many ways of doing that. Um, at least to some basic level, right? Some good level, comfortable living. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but look at uh, if you're into, look at look at what's going on around that field. It's uh, quite uh, interesting, and uh, particularly um, if you have any connection with politicians, you get them thinking about it because we do need to think about it. Otherwise, if we don't, um, we have the worst case scenario. Now, the worst case scenario, and there's a lot of things in between, obviously, but, you know, imagine some dystopian cyberpunk future where the companies run everything. Cyberpunk 2077 is a good example, um, where uh, you're basically on subsistence and you uh, it's even worse than now. Uh, you are completely, um, yeah, most, there's a few very rich people who control all the technology and then there's the rest. Um, or, you know, I watched 1984 the other night, actually, and it struck me, you know, uh, George was onto it there as well. Uh, 
it doesn't have to be quite this, but is not AI the most powerful mass surveillance tool that we could imagine? Remember Edward Snowden, right? And all that stuff from Edward Snowden, what the NSA are up to. Isn't it weird how OpenAI suddenly got a, a military person on the board? Isn't it weird that they're showing their systems to the, to the military and NSA and so on before they release them to the public? Um, I'm not a, like, I'm not usually like worrying about these conspiracies, but we know for a fact there are people who want to use it for surveillance. And um, if you're typing in, if, if an AI that you're using on your day-to-day -day basis more and more and you're talking to it like a friend, and if it's knowing everything about you, they've got unprecedented levels of access to everybody. And if you could influence the AIs to influence whole populations with certain sort of forms of bias, that's a pretty scary dystopia, scary dystopia, right? Um, so I'm not saying it's happening or it will happen, but I'm saying it's a possible scenario that we should probably guard against because once it goes too far down that particular scenario, it'll be hard to pull it back without, you know, all those Hollywood movies where we all get guns and go off and do things. Um, it didn't work for the guy in 1984, by the way. Now, um, Let's get back to education. As I said, I need to explain the context and set the scene for what is education doing now and what should EdTech do to support that, right? Number one, I believe education should move away from training when it, as and when it can for jobs and focus more on explicit skills and qualities like critical thinking, empathy, leadership, adaptability, the ability, because we're all going to have to adapt on a very frequent basis as whole industries crumble. Uh, resilience, creativity, mindfulness, um, and general knowledge too. Uh, but really, we're building capable, tough citizens. And these things can be worked into any curriculum, even if you're there for uh, to learn a particular, you know, set of things, you can work it in around that. So one of the things Moodle was designed around was around collaborative learning, because it's one thing to go, here is the content, you will memorize the content and spit it back out into a quiz and you're done. That's very shallow and it kind of treats people like a machine. Um, Interestingly, uh, the US Army and the US Air Force both use Moodle, and that's pretty much the major, <laughs> the major way they use it. Um, I'm not blaming them, but I'm just saying very large organizations still think that way about uh, education. They also focus on a lot of leadership and other things as well, I'm sure. Um, but uh, these are the things that are going to make us resilient in the future. And if you are in a collaborative environment, if you're listening and talking and sharing and a lot of your learning is not just from the content but from other people then you start to get a better grip on these kinds of skills so i still think that's very important it's fundamentally how human beings have evolved uh, yes exactly juan the, the liberal arts the um the these humanities to be human we need to be good at humanities and um that seems probably a better way of saying all this um, but I let's try and work that in to not only our curriculums, but our tools, right? Second point, education technology should focus on using AI to reduce admin, number one, and to transform or personalize data, number two. These this focus, uh, they're the things people don't like doing, but they're boring, they're machiney kind of things, right? Admin. Who loves picking a box a hundred times at the end of the semester? Who, who wants to like uh, do all the painful things that we all need to do as we are manipulating data in today's tools? Um, Admin things, that's a really great job for an AI to automate. Automate that stuff away so that we're freed up 
uh, to, to do the other things. The second one there about transforming and personalizing data, um, you may find yourself doing this already. You, if you, like very often, I don't watch YouTube videos much anymore, I skip through them, but if it's 40 minutes or an hour long, like this talk probably is going to be, uh, I haven't got the time. So I just get the URL, pop it through an AI and generate summaries. And I, I talk to the video with my summaries and I have reprocessed that data into a, a personalized form so I can extract what I want out of that really quickly. Now, those kinds of processes for learning uh, are really powerful. And I believe that's one of the best use cases of AI that there is. It, what we don't want to do is build products that replace the work a human brain needs to do to learn well. And this muscle, we know, needs to uh, behave or be put through uh, experiences in a certain way. And there's all the education research from the last 100 years. Um, you know, Vygotsky is still really onto it, in my opinion. Those, our brains haven't changed. They're not going to change for a while until we all get brain machine interfaces, perhaps. But until then, um, we need to work the muscle, just like you go to the gym and you work out to get muscles. You need to uh, work your brain. And we've got to make sure our tools do that. And I'm seeing all these uh, quick, quick and dirty ed tech products popping up that kind of take the work off your brain. A lot of that turns into entertainment, not education, and not good for learning deeply and for really getting a grip on, on topics and becoming good at something. So what does AI mean for EdTech? I think I'm going to come in with like 10 minutes QA time. It's great. Um, here are three uh, areas that I think make a lot of sense for EdTech. Number one, admins. We help them construct monitor and evolve efficient learning organizations. So even imagine we all have your UBI and none of us has a job, but you know, I want to get good at something. I'm really interested in becoming a great bass player or something, right? In a band. So I'm going to go to a bunch of people doing music and work with them. And they're going to teach me the best way to learn bass and, and I'll collaborate with them and I'll, I'll learn that instrument or I'm learning physics or whatever it is I'm interested in. Um, so there are still going to be learning organizations that you go to. Except you just have more time to go to them. So for the admins, it's about uh, uh, constructing and monitoring and evolving these organizations. So get the admin out of the way so the admin can do it better. The second part here is about Helping teachers build objectively high quality courses based on research. So uh, a teacher will come along usually to a, a blank online course with a lot of documents that they had from before, you know, maybe not so much now, but in the past they would come along with literal slides, you know, the old uh, overhead projector slides and things like that. And they need to get it online. Um, you can't just dump stuff online and call that an online course. You need to build it into a structure and have assessments and have gamification and uh, work on the whole experience of the online course. And that's learning design. And there is a lot of uh, experience and research around learning design that almost nobody has the time to do because they just not, it's not built into their teaching schedules. So they end up dumping this stuff online. AI could help with that. AI can help make great courses. And I think that is a really powerful application of AI that I, uh, I'd like to see and I'm working on it myself. The third one is now you have great courses, AI can personalize it to each person and it could be translating it from English into Spanish or Spanish into Chinese. It, uh, there's also leveling. So maybe the, the level of the language in the course is a bit too high for you or too low for you. And AI can help adjust that. It can translate to something that's right at your level. Um, the other thing about leveling actually is 
if you look at the person's background, remembering constructionism and constructivism, um, when you learn things, you, you build it on top of your previous understanding. Say you were a, uh, a builder and now you're learning about medicine, right? It might help to transform some of the examples or the analogies and start using builders analogies for things when you're learning about medicine. Um, that would help you a lot, right? Because those are the things you understand. So you could transform the course for that person and make it um, uh, more efficient for them to, to pick up that new information. Practice, AI is good at practice. It can generate unlimited examples or, uh, or things to make quizzes or whatever for yourself. Um, connection to the real world, I really like as well. So you're doing a course on a thing, maybe you're learning about some management technique and uh, let's say you're learning about a, um, uh, that's a good example, oh, a management technique, right? And lo and behold, out there is a startup that has turned that management technique into a product. And the person who made that startup maybe is the same person who wrote this paper in your course. So you've been reading this paper and you didn't know that that person has now gone on and done this thing. That's super useful information, right? And AIs can be expanding and connecting a course to the real world to make it more interesting and better for you, connecting you to the real world. And lastly, a really good application for AI is time management. I, we all have busy lives, lots of things going on. Uh, right now, as a uni university student, you'll have like six courses you're doing at once. Uh, all those teachers will just make assignments and assessments up uh, according to their own schedule. And now you have a flood of things you have to do and you need to manage that time. An AI that knows you and knows your schedule can fit that stuff into your life. Like a personal assistant. I've had an executive assistant for the last 10 years and it's the best thing ever. Um, she just organizes my calendar and I've experienced it. So do rich people. So uh, the AI can be, we could all have a great personal assistant and it's probably the one that we get from Apple or Google or whatever that knows us and it will work together with a course to help fit our learning into our life. And I think that's another good case as well. So these are kind of how AI can affect ed tech, I think, in really transformative, useful ways. About 10 startups in there. No, there isn't. I'm joking. There's 10 features you should all add to your product. Now, there's challenges. Um, ethics, right? There's a lot of data flowing around everywhere, right? We, we still have to work out these data issues. I... Uh, I love the fact that data has led to such an amazing thing as AI. Um, uh, some, some people talk about it as a, AI is like a tissue. It's like a piece of, like a muscle, like a bit of nature that we've discovered. Um, and data seems to be the blood and the energy that makes those things work. But we also have to resolve that against our personal data and ownership and privacy as well. Um, and I'm, I also strongly support that. So. These are things we need to work on. Legacy issues. There's a lot of uh, uh, existing systems that need to be upgraded all the way up and down the stack. A lot to do. This one's tricky. The, the VC startup model. The idea that someone can pump a bunch of money into a couple of, uh, a couple of people and, and then try and create a billion dollar company out of it that whole thing is a bit sick. It's a bit cancerous. Uh, it's led to a lot of development, but it also leads to a lot of toxic behavior on the internet. And the noise and the marketing as people try and pump this thing for all it's worth to make a lot of bucks, right? That's toxic to education, that stuff. And that distracts from true infrastructure. And we should fight back against that whenever we can. That is uh, at the root of a lot of the issues in EdTech today. Um, and finally, global collaboration. Um, many, there's many cultures, there's many agendas in education. Um, I love Aperio, I love what it stands for, what it's doing. I guess I don't talk with you guys very much because I'm doing my own things. And the same is true of at least a dozen other organizations I can think of that I admire and I like, and they're doing their thing. And it's like, 
how do we how do we all work on the same things? That's why I thought I'll invent the 15th standard, the open ed tech, like to try and tie together some of the standards. Um, there's so many great initiatives around, um, but it's very difficult for any one brain to keep up with them or to see any clear winners. Um, some of them are very specific to a particular country or a particular way of thinking or a particular type of education and so on. So, you know, that's the challenge we're all going to have to work on is, is how do we bring it together somewhat and think globally all the time. Um, think global, but act local. My last slide, uh, it's what it's all building towards, I think, why openness matters. And maybe you're a proponent of open and you've found it hard to tell people why it's good. So I did a little bit of thinking. I tried to get it down as short as I could. Why is open, why is the open way of doing things good? And it's not even clear actually sometimes why it is because, you know, if you've got a bit of money, you can go out and buy anything you want and it's all available. It's all open, right? It's all there. But I think there are deeper issues at play. So number one, openness informs future AI. Do you want the AI of the future that is super powerful and like is able to build a company itself and market a product itself? Do you want that AI based on the VC startup thing of the past? Or do you want it based on people like us, if I may presume to be so bold, who believe in uh, open sharing infrastructure, love, humanity? The second is my opinion, right? So we need to pump that out onto the internet so that the AIs know that, so that it's part of this very video will be on YouTube and will be sucked up and scraped up into the AIs of the future. And so I, we all have our job to do because the misinformation in the world, the only way to combat that is with truth. Put out your truth, get it out there. And it, our opinions are important too, but if you can base it on science and on research and references, better. So do that. That's one good reason to be open. It also gives us flexibility because if things are open, I can experiment and build a new platform by taking lots of components and plugging them together and try something completely new. And it doesn't have to be a person doing that. It can be an AI doing that in future. The AI will be able to build new products based on a prompt. I'm already building, maybe you are too, I'm already building lots of software by just a couple of prompts. Um, when I was 17 on my very first Mac 512K, I built a game, it took me two weeks in Pascal. Uh, I built the very same game in eight minutes using Claude. This is, and if, if uh, it works so well because a lot of the things that it uses are open things, like there's Python and React and all of that. So number two, it protects against the dystopias because we have backup systems. So I love Linux. Linux is in fact underpinning most of the dot-coms on the internet. They never talk about it, but 80% of everything is open source out there running the world. You only hear about the top layer with the marketing and the paywall, right? Um, but if, if, if we build open source into everything, we have good backup systems. If some company becomes nasty, or, you know, uh, bad for us, a bit like Microsoft wanting to record everything on our screen and, and, and pump that out to the world. Um, we can push back and go, no, there's an alternative. Uh, we can very quickly build alternatives because we have most of the stack already in open source. So even if you're using commercial products, um, having open source is always a good thing. And secondly, it provides transparency and trust. If we are able to see all the parts of a big thing, especially one that is potentially doing all the work in our society. It's very important that we're able to trust those components. We need to be able to know how they work. We have to, we need to be able to inspect uh, the ins and outs and the control systems behind it and the bias and the training data that was used and all those things we need to, we need transparency. As a society, we need that transparency because otherwise there's too much uh, dystopia possibilities, right? 
So, yeah. So if you need it, why openness matters, I think uh, that's my attempt at a single slide that explains why, especially when it comes to AI, which is so powerful. Um, oh, I thought I thought I was finished. Got one more quick one. Um, how to be open in the age of AI. Keep up your learning. Openly publish as much as you can. Cite your sources, especially AI. Um, keep things simple too. Simple things are much better than more complicated things generally. Um, and uh, don't obfuscate. So, so many nice standards were so complex, no one could implement them, so they never got used. Um, and that's this sort of stuff happens everywhere. Simplicity, like HTTP or the original LTI, they're great standards because they, they really work. Um, make sustainability a key goal. Definitely include that in anything you're working on. Think about the sustainability of it. Uh, if it's just an idea and you want to get it out there, that's fine. But if it's something you want people to use, you need to build a sustainability around it. It's just like nature. Um, you know, things have to sustain themselves. Um, support other people being open, right? That's why I'm here. And um, let, let's all support each other, amplify each other, help each other. And, and lastly, let's make AI and education good for people. Yeah, not for companies, not for the bottom line, but good for people. And I think we can't really go wrong if we keep these things in mind. So uh, maybe I'll see you in uh, post Scar City and um, uh, uh, I'll end it there. If you need to contact me, here's my contact details. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, and uh, have a chat with you all. And thank you very much. And look, I, maybe we have time for questions. I went on a bit longer than I thought. Yeah, we are um, We are at the end of the hour, but we can take a couple questions uh, if you have you know, a couple more minutes to, to stay with us. Does anybody have anything that they would like to ask? All right, so Tonko, you asked, uh, when are we going to use AI to generate or combine the better ed tech standards? So that's something I actually have been thinking about doing, working a bit on. I haven't had time myself. Um, as open ed tech is a bit uh, not very well funded yet. A lot of things are happening, right? But um, it, as I said, I think a core set of simple standards that we agree on, like, and I'm talking about things like RSS. RSS powers the world. It's so, it's so, uh, it's so much of an infrastructure that we just forget it. It's kind of almost invisible. Weirdly, the browsers all dropped all the icons for it for a while, but it's having a resurgence, I think. But if you just want the most basic way of getting a stream of information from one computer to another, RSS. Um, Activity Pub is a very good thing now, it's W3C standard. So um, if we have a lot of very simple things, they're good Lego blocks that a developer or an AI can use to build much more complicated things and I feel like that's a better way than developing increasingly more complex standards. Um, and that's my general approach, I think, to these things. But yes, working on it is, is the job of OET and please come and join in. Uh, Norbert, you're asking about how will OET take place in Europe? Well, it's actually based in Brussels, not that it's just like formally as, a, as an organization, which took two years to make happen, by the way. But um, it's, uh, it's a global thing and it, uh, there are OET meetings, usually at Moodle Moots right now, but I think in the future we might have more uh, independent events as well once we get a bit more um, budget. Anne-Marie, would you like to oh. come on the mic? Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Wilma. Morning, Martin, uh, or afternoon, or whatever it is where you are. <laughs> if you're Night on time. the other side. <laughs> Night time, cool. Um, I'm trying to write something at the moment for, for Hewlett on OER, AI, open source AI. You will not be surprised by that. And the cognitive dissonance I can't get my head around is how we think we can do open things with technologies that today are largely ingesting closed things. Like there's just, I can't see how, can't see how we can square that circle. I just don't have any belief that the same people who, you know, who, who fought to close down the internet archives lending library aren't, you know, they're not gonna roll over. There's vested interests in this space. So I'm all over the arguments oh, yeah. for, 
for build and roll our own, obviously, but some of the power of these tools comes from the volume of content they've ingested. I don't, so how do we, can we square that circle? I'm not sure we can, I'm just interested in your thought. Yeah, well, um, we're in an interesting stage at the moment where all the LLMs that we're using uh, just scrape to the internet, Wikipedia and uh, the web and archive.org and all that stuff. Everything you've written and put out there probably and everything I've written and put out there is all in there. Um, and we're in this interesting place where that is now a capable system that can do real work for us and we can build the next generation using that tool. And a lot of people are working on uh, synthetic data. So you can build data sets by Imagine you take uh, a dictionary and you say, for every word in the dictionary, generate a definition of the, that word. And then you have other LLMs that are now checking the definition until you're satisfied that they're all pretty good. And you could human check it if you wanted, but there are ways to do it with AIs. And now you have a, a massive encyclopedia of definitions that you can use as training data for another AI. And that kind of uh, leveraging of systems is what we're going to see more and more of and more capability. And as I said, with robots, once they're embodied and out in the world and looking at the world like we are, walking around in towns and um, uh, absorbing and uh, interpreting what they're seeing, there's endless amounts of data there as well. So I'm not too worried about the data personally from what I'm seeing. I feel like that's we're in a weird state at the moment, um, but uh, I, I think it's solvable. All right, um, great. Well, I, I think we've kind of gone about five minutes over, so I'm going to go ahead and cut us off. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But thank you so much, Martin, for a truly inspiring and informative talk. I know, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are still sort of processing all the different scenarios you painted, but I would definitely want to be in Postcard City and not sort of Blade Runner. Bill. So, uh, so yes, thank you so much um, for kind of starting us thinking if we haven't been already about some of these topics. And you have Martin's contact information if you wanted to follow up with him. Once again, thank you so much on behalf of Aperio for um, taking part in our microphone session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Um, we'll see you around on the internet.